I'd like to call to order the meeting of the Emeryville Planning Commission for um, March, what is this, 22nd, <coughs> 2018. Do we have a roll call, Charlie? Commissioner Guerrero? Here. Commissioner Kang has an excused absence. Commissioner Keller? Here. Commissioner Thompson? Here. Vice Chair Barrera has an excused absence. Uh, Chair Donaldson? Here. So we have a quorum of four commissioners present. Okay, this is a time for public comment for items that are not on the agenda. Is there anyone wishing to speak? Seeing no one, we'll move on to the action minutes from February 22nd. Any corrections, additions? I move approval. Second. Okay, any up? I don't think, do we need a roll call? Uh, I don't think so. Um, let's see, was everybody uh, Commissioner Guerrero actually was not there. Oh, okay. Mm. I'll second. So do we have enough to approve So we it? have to bring it back next time. Yeah, there's not a quorum. We don't have four. Oh, wait, there is. There's no, a quorum. she can't vote. Abstain. But Commissioner but Guerrero has to abstain. It's three of the four that have to vote for it. Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah. okay. Oh, That's okay. Right. Well, so, I'll, I'll second. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Without objection? With one abstention? Uh, All right. A couple of absences. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, community Development Director's Report. All right. Let me uh, tell you what the City Council has done since your last meeting. They've had two meetings since then, and those were on March 6th and, and March 20th. The uh, March 6th report is a little bit lengthy, so please bear with me. They did a lot of things at that meeting. Uh, the council unanimously approved the second reading of an ordinance to put a $50 million affordable housing general obligation bond measure on the June 2018 ballot. This will require a two-thirds affirmative vote of the people to pass, and if it does pass, we will have more resources for affordable housing. On the Shell Mound Way general plan amendment, the council did not approve the proposed general plan amendment to leave Shell Mound Way in its current location, which the commission had recommended at your June, January 25th meeting. Rather, they continued the item to a future meeting to allow staff to modify the proposal to also include a new pedestrian and bicycle path in the approximate location where Shell Mound Way is now shown in the general plan to connect Christie Avenue to Shell Mound Street. This was recommended by the Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Committee at their meeting on uh, Monday night. Uh, that was the immediate uh, night preceding the City Council meeting. Because this is a substantive change to the general plan amendment that had been proposed, it will now have to come back to the Commission for another recommendation before being presented to the Council for adoption. We have it tentatively scheduled for your May 24th meeting. On the 1258 Ocean Avenue uh, modification to add roof decks, the council approved this proposal on a vote of three to two, with council member Pats and Mayor Bowders voting no. As you may recall, the commission had recommended approval at your January 25th meeting with Chair Donaldson voting no, Vice Chair Barrera abstaining, and Commissioner Thompson absent. On the Sherwin-Williams Park Impact Fee Credit, with Mayor Bowders recused because he lives across the street, the Council unanimously approved a Park and Recreation Facility Impact Fee Credit for the Sherwin-Williams Project and authorized the City Manager to execute a Park and Open Space Improvement Agreement with Lennar. <coughs> The council unanimously approved the proposed mid-cycle budget adjustments, which reinstates one community and economic development coordinator position, which is Emmy Terrio, and one management analyst position, which is April Shabazz, in the economic development and housing division. And this means there will now be no layoffs in the community development department, as had originally been proposed, and there were no other significant changes for our department. So those. Uh, mid-cycle budget adjustments were good news for us. Uh, and finally, on March 6th, um, kind of the main event in a way, uh, the City Council goals. Mayor Bowders facilitated a discussion of the Council's goals, which resulted in 10 goals. And those 10 goals are, num and these are in priority order, number one, South Bayfront Bridge, two, the housing bond, three, active transportation and safety, four, the Art Center, five, disaster preparedness exercises and plan, six, the parking management plan, seven, railroad quiet zones, 
Eight, revenue generating businesses. Nine, creation of a communication director position. And 10, minor capital improvement projects that might otherwise slip through the cracks, the first of which is improvements to Davenport Park. Uh, the next step in this process will be for the council to consider timelines for these goals, and they're scheduled to do that at their April 17th meeting. Then on March 20th, the council hosted a special celebration of Women's History Month, including remarks by Assembly Member Nancy, I'm sorry, Senator Nancy Skinner's District Representative, Ariana Jukes, performances by two girls' bands, and proclamations for several honorees, including our own Planning Commission Chair, Gail Donaldson. Um, the council approved the annual progress report on implementation of the general plan, including the housing element in calendar year 2017 for submittal to the state. As you may recall, the commission reviewed this report at your February 22nd meeting and it was sent to the state yesterday. <coughs> Finally, the council approved the selection of four finalists for a public art project at the marina, which was recommended by the public art committee. And in other news, I would like to direct your attention to uh, this flyer that should be sitting in front of you for Emeryville Day on the Bay. That is this coming Saturday, day after tomorrow, um, rain or shine. It's from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., should be lots of fun. There will be live music, food vendors, a beer garden, boat rides, and the shortest triathlon <coughs> ever. So hope to see you all out there. And finally, um, I emailed this to you just a few hours ago. I don't know if you've seen it yet, but it should also be sitting in front of you, which is a farewell letter that you have received from former Commissioner Phil Banta. He is very eloquent as usual. Uh, his term would have ended on June 30th of this year, so the council will be reappointing a replacement for him in June as part of the regular annual Planning Commission appointment process. So there should be a commissioner to replace Commissioner Banta uh, for your July meeting. The other commissioner whose term expires on June 30th is Commissioner Thompson, and I have advised her that if she wishes to be reappointed, she will need to file an application with the city clerk. That concludes my report. I'd be happy to respond to any questions you may have. Any questions? No? Okay. Thank you very much. Disclosure of conflicts of interest and in ex parte communications. I haven't spoken to anybody? Mm -hmm. Nope. Okay, well then we can move on to the public hearings. The first public hearing is on Adeline Springs. <coughs> Good evening, Commission. Uh, you have seen this project earlier uh, in three study sessions starting from September of last year and the last one was in January a couple of months ago um, so just to do a quick review of where this is it's in the south end of a town uh, on Adeline and MacArthur it's a 0.29 acre parcel uh, there's an existing one-story building uh, about 6,000 square feet uh, in use and this will be demolished uh, to accommodate uh, the project. Uh, this is the existing site plan. And the reason I show this is that uh, uh, the proposal more or less uh, follows the footprint of the existing site. And this is the proposed site plan. Uh, and just to point out uh, that there will be a, um, a bulb out here and also a uh, crossing rod here. This is a close-up of the ground floor. Uh, essentially, the programming remains the same. We had 29 units and six live work units. And I'm going to go through some of the changes from January that have been made. There was an issue regarding uh, the green wall uh, neighboring, uh, neighboring Vicky Sowell's uh, property. And uh, we were showing at that time uh, trees. And there was the question of whether the green wall could be um, saved. And as it works out, it can be. So these trees will not be planted, and the wall, uh, the green existing green wall, will be supported during construction, and then they will be replaced, and there will be a six-foot uh, fence. Uh, regarding bike parking, they have put the short-term bike parking on along Adeline Street, uh, which is 
probably more appropriate, and there was an issue regarding access to the live work units which were interior facing, and the ones which were exterior facing, exterior meaning uh, which had street frontage, didn't seem to have those, so these have been included, those in each of the live work unit fronting Adeline and MacArthur have been added, and there has been a buzzer uh, installed which would allow for entry to uh, uh, these two live work units which don't have a street frontage. There was a question regarding EV red, the parking uh, stalls being uh, EV ready at that time and at the writing of the staff report, uh, the applicant uh, did uh, say that he would be willing to have all the spaces uh, EV ready, but on further, um, uh, further investigation into how much it would cost, uh, uh, the applicant has requested that be changed to three EV uh, ready spaces. Just in terms of our requirements, uh, this project is not required uh, to have any uh, EV ready or EV uh, stations because it's uh, small. Uh, uh, so there was a little bit more uh, refinement in the landscape plan. So as you can see, the, uh, the, there are no trees along the rare property line. Uh, we have about seven street trees, four on-site street trees. Uh, there are green screens along uh, the street frontage, and there are planters uh, as well. So in terms of, this is just to give you a quick idea of the building. It's a five-story building reaching a height of 59 feet. And uh, in terms of the unit mix, we do have a mix of studios, one bedroom, two, and three. Uh, just a correction, the studio number will is, is included as nine. This will be reduced to eight. And uh, one bedroom would be increased <coughs> to 10. This is to meet the uh, requirements of no more than 10% of the studios need to be uh, 10%. Uh, so this one is slightly over, so they need to reduce uh, the number of studios and increase the one bedroom. So these are the flow plans. Uh, each floor has a mix of studios one, two, and three. On the fourth, pl on the fourth floor, uh, there's a sort of a lookout, and then on the fifth floor, there are, is where the uh, amenities are included. And as in your plans, you can see the images of uh, the various amenities, and that include a barbecue pipette, uh, there's a community planters, gardening, uh, pl garden planters, and of course, seating. So these are the elevations. Uh, they have not changed since January, and I'm going to let uh, the applicant and the architect walk you through the various materials, uh, and you can see the color and material boards uh, in front of you here. So this is the Adeline uh, uh, elevation. As you can see, they are still proposing one uh, public art piece, and then there are green screens. So this elevation, again, has not changed since January. A uh, few more green screens here. Uh, this is the elevation from the parking lot, and this is the, the, north, the south elevation, so this is what the neighbor uh, would be looking at. This is a daytime rendering, and this is a nighttime rendering. Uh, in, in, at the January study session, uh, included a transportation analysis, and there were several recommendations, which at this point have been incorporated, and one was the provision of high visibility crosswalk on Adeline Street and installation of, uh, of, uh, of a rectangular rapid flashing beacon. So this has been included in the plans, and they have also been uh, memorialized as a condition of approval. There was an issue about the short-term bicycle parking spaces in the lobby, so that has changed, like I indicated. Uh, it has, the short-term has moved on to Adeline Street, uh, and this has been memorialized in the condition of approval. Uh, there was also a recommendation of having, uh, considering a loading, unloading, and which could also serve as a passenger pickoff and drop off uh, for delivery vehicles and also for resident move in, move out. And this has been included. Uh, the lo loading zone is shown on Adeline and is memorialized in the condition of approval, which kind of uh, outlines the process of uh, getting uh, a loading zone uh, designated on their frontage. 
Uh, the traffic report also recommended having a TDM plan. So our regulations allow the applicant either to do a TDM plan or uh, have a letter from Transform indicating that the, profit, uh, the project qualifies for the green trip reduction, green trip certification. And this was also included last time in January and is included in your package uh, uh, today. So in terms of uh, compliance with the planning regulations, uh, this is in the MURS base zone and uh, there's a transit uh, hub overlay. Uh, the use classification is uh, multi-unit residential, which is allowed by right, and light live work units, uh, which requires a CUP. In terms of density, the base density uh, that is here is 50, which can be increased with bonus to 100 units per acre. Uh, they are proposing uh, 100 units per acre, and so they will need 100 bonus points. FAR, base is 1.5, can, that can be increased to 3.0, and they are proposing uh, 2.3, which triggers 53 bonus points. Height, uh, base height is 40. Uh, bonus height can be increased to 75 feet. And uh, the proposal is for 59 feet, so it requires uh, 54 uh, points for height. And as you know, when you have several categories requiring uh, bonus points, we pick uh, the one that needs the highest. So the project will need 100 bonus points. Uh, in terms of the unit mix and family-friendly design, uh, the requirement is uh, 50 units need to be two and three bedroom units, of which 15 needs to be three bedroom, and only 10 can be studios, so the project uh, as conditioned uh, meets this requirement. In terms of family-friendly flow plans, the, uh, the proposal is in compliance <coughs> and the staff report includes this uh, checklist that we use uh, to demonstrate compliance about, uh, on the basis of each uh, different, each criteria uh, or each guideline. In terms of traffic uh, and parking, uh, this does lie in the transit hub, uh, so all the parking is reduced by 50 percent, so this, uh, meet, this makes the requirement to be 15 to 24 spaces. They are proposing 15 spaces. Bike parking, uh, the requirement is three short-term and 31 long-term spaces, and they, uh, in the plans, show four short-term on Adeline and 32 long-term in a secure bike space, and I will be coming back to that at bike parking at the end of the presentation, they have increased the number of uh, bike parking, both short term and uh, long term, uh, at the request of Transform. So uh, that's what the change in condition of approval will, will be. So there is a memo here, and uh, that kind of basically uh, states that uh, instead of the four short term and 32 long term, they will provide seven short term on Adeline and 35 uh, long-term. So, so that is the change uh, since the staff report. Open space, uh, the required private open space uh, works out to 1,400 square feet. The common open space requirements is 700, 700 square feet. Uh, the R regulations also allow for a, uh, a substitution on a two to one uh, ratio. So what that comes to is a 700 <coughs> square feet of private space and about 19,000 uh, square feet of public space. And what they are providing is in terms of that 19 units of the, out of the 29 have balcony and there is the rooftop uh, common open space and that uh, brings us to the requirement of uh, the open space. Sidewalk design guidelines, uh, the requirement is 12 foot uh, wide sidewalk uh, with a minimum of 7.5 clay pedestrian pathway as well as a landscaped area and the proposal is 12 feet on the <coughs> streets. In terms of TDM, uh, this is a requirement. Like I mentioned, they are uh, they have a certification from Green, green Trip, uh, from Transform for Green Trip certification, and therefore this requirement is considered to have been met. Um, so let's talk about the bonus points. This was the last uh, thing that was uh, open-ended in the January study session. So as like I mentioned, 
Half of them will come out of provision of on-site uh, affordable housing, so that is five units, one at very low, in very low income, one at low income, and two, I'm sorry, one at very low, uh, two at low, and two at moderate. So the other 50 points, uh, there was a discussion about that, and the uh, commission's preference was undergrounding of utilities um, along uh, undergrounding of utilities along Adeline or uh, widening of sidewalks on West MacArthur Boulevard. Uh, just as a reminder, they need 50 points. 10 bonus points can be earned for each 1% of the total construction valuation. 50, boy, 50 is what they need, so that uh, translates to 5% of valuation, and that in dollar terms is uh, about, as you can see, a little over a quarter million dollars. Uh, so so this is the amount of money that we have in terms of getting community benefits. So uh, as the commission wanted uh, the, this money to be used for undergrounding, uh, the applicant submitted an estimate for that. And the estimate for that is almost four times what they, uh, what, what they are, uh, what is due, that, that's four times what they are Okay, let me try this again. <laughs> All right, so uh, they have about a quarter of a million dollars to be used towards bo earning bonus points. The estimate for undergrounding the utilities is over one million, so that does not permit them to do this undergrounding. So the second thing that uh, there was a preference was uh, widening the sidewalk. Now, uh, so the widening of the sidewalk is a lot cheaper. So the applicant got estimate for widening the sidewalk both on Adeline and MacArthur, and that came closer to what uh, would be, what they would have, what they could pay for the community benefits. Uh, now, our recommendation is that we use the bonus point money to widen MacArthur Boulevard only, because Although the widening of the MacArthur Boulevard will cost only $45,000, this does not include the actual other things that are needed to make a street pedestrian friendly, more walkable, and things like street trees. Also, we want uh, the reconfiguration of West MacArthur Boulevard so that we can put the on-street parking on right side instead of the left side where it is, and uh, repaving, and that would involve repaving of the street. So. All this will mean money, just the trees alone, for example, with the rootable soil are about, if, if you want to three, three, it's almost $60,000 right off the cuff for the trees alone. Uh, if, if, all, uh, if the complete kind of widening with all the goodies does not use up the quarter million dollars, then the remaining can be uh, given to the small business fund. So that's how uh, the recommendation is, and that's how the conditions have been written, that uh, they would widen the MacArthur, include uh, different things such as street trees, park, uh, reconfiguration of the uh, <coughs> lanes, and repaving of the street. The other reason why the Adeline uh, sidewalk widening is not attractive to staff, because if what it would mean is that uh, the sidewalk would uh, it would, the curb would move, making the existing poles in between the expanded sidewalk. So that's the reason we think that uh, the money is better spent making the widening of the MacArthur, uh, you know, uh, with all the goodies that come with uh, a streetscape. So that concludes my pre uh, presentation. If there are any questions, I would be happy to answer. We are recommending approval, subject to the conditions of approval, and um, and the uh, modifications outlined in the memo. The, pre the, uh, the applicant does have a presentation, uh, so if you don't have questions for me, I will hand it over uh, to Kaba. Any questions? Um, yeah, this might this is a question, but it might be a little protracted, so we may want to wait till we get to commissioner comments. But I want to get into the undergrounding utilities, and that has been an option. Um, does the city not have a fund that we're putting money into for undergrounding? No. Oh, okay. I was, 
I thought that when we were talking about the Bakey Lofts 3, we were talking about um, that developer putting money into a fund for undergrounding. So the city has no money set aside that we're acquiring to do undergrounding on our own. Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Well, you'd be aware of it. Yeah. <laughs> well, that kind of that makes the rest of it moot then. Okay, thank you. Jordan, the discussion? Yes. Do you have any questions? Any questions? Well, I guess I do have a question about the um, sidewalk and thinking thinking about the um, elements of it. I know that you've gotten a quote and uh, for undergrounding, then a quote for um, repaving uh, or widening. Or, widening, yeah. Or widening. Um, and so that question about the quote for street trees, the quote for street furniture, the additional design of the sidewalk. Um, I just wasn't sure exactly how you're handling all of those elements because uh, in, in terms of just having a comprehensive public realm rather than a sidewalk extension, is there is there a more comprehensive method? Uh, not at this time. So what happened was that it took a very long time to get a quote for undergrounding utilities. The applicants spent all the time trying to get a uh, quote for that, as it was uh, both the staff and the commission's desire to see that uh, undergrounding. And that, when it came out, it was, you know, impossible to do. And so he had to kind of, you know, get other estimates for the sidewalk extension. So there has not been any time to get a true estimate of what we are recommending that the commission approve. But if, you know, the way to look at it is that if uh, we run out of money, then, you know, so we won't have a street light or we won't have a, we have one less tree. If money is left over, then that money would then go to the small uh, business fund that okay. the city has. So that's the way we are handling it. I just had one quick question. In the Fair and Peers report, it said that there would be a net gain of four on street parking spaces. Is that even with the um, loading and the 25 foot setback? Uh, no. No, so the report was written before. Uh, they recommended that, though. I mean, they recommended the loading zone and the 25-foot red zone. Right, but on-street parking is not in our calculation in any case. I know. So, they, so, so having the loading zone or decrease in, you know, it's a recommendation that we can't force on. If it is available, that's great, but it's not. So, and, we, and staff considers that the loading zone would be very useful. Mm -hmm. uh, given, you know, given the uh, configuration. Yeah. No, I was just wondering. Okay. <clears throat> I, I did have a follow-up question. I didn't know if it was for you or the developer, but again, the staff report is talking about residential units and four to six live workspace. Have we not settled on six works, works, workspaces, live workspaces? It, we are showing six, but this allows them to, if, if, if there is a tenant that wants bigger space, Oh, okay. Then okay. they can combine it. Oh, okay. The total okay. area of live work remains the same. That's okay. That's what I wasn't saying. Yeah. I didn't want that space being turned into extra parking or something arbitrary. No, no, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the, it, it might it still be live work space under the same square footage. Perfect. Yeah. That makes great sense. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Does the applicant want to give a presentation? All right. Good evening, my name is Ali Kashani. Um, this is our fourth presentation before you, um, starting in July 2017. Um, um, staff has done a very good job of um, explaining in full detail the, the recommendations you made and the responses we gave in the last three study sessions. Um, I'm just going to recap a couple of highlights that I want to call to your attention. Our neighbors, Vicky and Steve, uh, asked at the last, uh, actually before I, I get, get into that, I wanted to introduce Jackie Keller, our landscape architects here, and Nina Rizzo with Transform is here, and of course Kava Massey, and the one that's really doing all the work is Cecilia Serrata, the young lady right there, and my partner Joe Blum's here. Um, uh, we met with, um, with Vicky and Steve uh, and looked at the existing hollow clay wall that functions as the 
fence between our property and theirs, which is the remnant of the building that was there that caught fire in the 1980s. So they had asked that we not remove that wall. So we looked at it. The wall actually encroaches on their property by about five inches. And it's not a very safe or stable wall. It's hollow clay and not reinforced. So I met with them in, you know, in a showery day like today and uh, noticed that they actually had installed their own green wall uh, a few inches from this wall with four by four posts and wire mesh and so their plants grow on it. So we agreed that we would remove our wall and support their green wall uh, as much as we can during construction and install a wood fence and they wanted uh, to be eight foot high. And I said, the, the city has to grant us a specific use permit. So we're requesting an eight foot height for the, uh, for the fence between us and them. Um, and I think that got in, uh, in Miru's uh, report. Eight foot fence is allowed? You don't need us any special? Use permit, okay. Use permit. All right. I'm used to six foot in Berkeley. Well, so. you will need a building permit for it. Yeah. Anything over six feet needs a building permit, but eight foot fences are allowed. Are allowed, okay, in Emeryville but, they are. Except in residential zones. Right, right. Um, and as with our neighbor at uh, 3629 Adeline, the single family home next door to us, uh, with whom we worked very closely, we met with them, and as you've noticed, we've pulled the building back um, they um, are happy and they said that they were going to try to come and speak in support of the project, so they're not here. Um, regarding um, the undergrounding of the utilities, I spent with the city's engineering department re referrals uh, time since January with three different reputable uh, undergrounding engineering firms and was able to get one estimate from one of them, which is included in your packet. And the cost seemed to far exceed what our fee is. Um, and then as with uh, MacArthur, I think the recommendation of the staff is well thought out, is to reconfigure the, the, lane, the lane reconfiguration, because par cars right now park on the right, right, wrong side of the street, not close to the curb. We will have to work with Caltrans and the city to, to do that. And to the extent the money is available to do the street planting and lighting, we would have liked to do that on Adeline and you know increase street lighting on Adeline because the, this existing street lighting is on the east side of the street. So to the extent that you are amenable to the idea of if there is money left over that we do from the be community benefit fee that we do consider installing street light on Adeline um, as well. Um, that's something we, we think uh, will benefit uh, um, uh, our project and Adeline Street because we are redoing the, uh, the sidewalk. Um, as um, Miru mentioned, um, we have, uh, we're showing on the plans <clears throat> four studios and your regulations say no more than 10% um, of the units shall be studios, that means three. So we do have a studio on the fourth floor that is 573 square feet. We're gonna convert that to a one bedroom so that there's no issue there. So we will meet that condition, which is included in the addendum that uh, Miru uh, handed out today uh, on the bottom. If you don't have any questions, Kaveh is here. You've seen his presentation, and uh, it seemed like at the January meeting you were uh, pretty satisfied with uh, uh, the skin of the building, but we're here to answer any questions. Thank you. Where are you proposing to, uh, suggesting to put street lights all the way along the west side of Adeline? Um, way, I don't think there's enough it? money to do, to do it all the way. Um, we, um, um, would do it on, uh, there, there's one telephone pole right in front, right on the corner, and then there's another one down the street. We were thinking we could install street light on the existing poles on the west side of Adeline. Yes. Okay. 
Any questions? Do we want to hear a presentation from the architects? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. Far right. This guy? Um, is this full screen? No. Are we good? Full screen. Could be that. Oh, that's where it is. Right. So it's right in case you yes. just. Uh... Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, exciting to be here after uh, a few study sessions and to hopefully get a positive uh, a vote on the project. Um, as Miro said, um, not a whole lot has changed on the project, a few minor uh, items, but I'll be happy to quickly go through it. It won't take up a whole lot of your evening uh, doing that. A full set of um, landscape drawings are now drawn up with uh, all of the, um, the planting materials and even some irrigation drawings have been started. The roof uh, garden um, on the fifth floor, which is the one on the right hand side, um, looks uh, to be working really well as a community space with uh, some um, planters for growing um, stuff in, um, a little bit of a barbecue area, seating areas, and uh, some nice paving. Uh, that's in the middle of that uh, darker area. Um, these are the palette uh, that uh, is being suggested by uh, Jackie's office uh, for the project. Uh, <coughs> and um, I think these are the, uh, are these the irrigation plants. Yeah, they're, they're just getting started, so there isn't a whole lot of... Um, and then a few of these uh, basic uh, details that uh, go along with a lot of uh, a lot of projects. Um, the site, and as you recall in the beginning, the the shadows were a big um, point of discussion, and we had to do felt like we needed to do this drawing to just show that the building doesn't really impact uh, the neighbors as much uh, as one would fear. Photos of the existing area, uh, a project we did a few doors down <coughs> from the freeway, and then from the yard of the, the, the business that's there now. Um, so um, this was worked through with the, with the staff at the city, trash management. Um, I think one of the nicest things that's come out of this project is getting that bulb out at the corner of MacArthur and Adeline, as much as I like the building itself. But it's such a dangerous intersection as people whip to the right as they come up MacArthur that this should be really, really nice and helpful. Um, so the ground floor um, should be really um, well activated on the on the sidewalk with plenty of glass and transparency. Um, with the right live work uh, uses and and uh, activities, it should um, add to a bunch of new uh, eyes on the street and sort of make the corner a little less, uh, it, it's, it's a little um, uh, vacant right now with the, with the business having a, a pretty blank wall in the corner. Uh, we added a community room, which is uh, the, the room that's uh, the pink color on the, uh, on the right up there uh, with its own door so it can be uh, people can come in without having to go through the lobby. Um, 
it's nice that the neighbors are fairly content and happy with the way things have turned out. Um, the plan is pretty efficient, a uh, pretty short corridor, and in general, it's a pretty modest building. It's about the size of three houses in, in terms of its width on Adeline. Um, so, you know, not having to tuck the parking under it, it's kept it shorter than what normally happens in projects like this. Um, some images to go with the, the garden and that, that's being proposed on the fifth floor. This is just a right up of the family stuff. Um, elevations, um, the one study session, uh, we had a difficult time explaining the actual um, siding and uh, the, the consequent one in, in, in January, we seem to have it um, sort of quieted down just because there's less of it. Um, um, in essence, um, about um, everything above the first floor, which is a pretty tall first floor, it's at about, is it still at 18? 19 feet, 19 feet floor to floor. Um, is this corrugated uh, material, and then in front of the, the windows, as a jealousy uh, railing, uh, this perforated um, um, sort of kind is, 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 is being proposed. Um, we also added those vertical elements uh, that are going to be made out of um, this material that's called Parklex. It's basically and wood that won't discolor or bleach. And uh, the corner uh, balconies uh, are going to be the same perforation except flat. And that's the only two variations we have. Um, this is the west elevation facing the bay, uh, the south, and then the sections. Um, a sheet that shows some of the details we're hoping to uh, incorporate into the project, and these uh, shadow studies that were done earlier on, <coughs> and they're still in this set. Um, we were asked to actually look at the most critical times of the day, which is in the mornings, uh, in the winter time. So we did these three to show that not the entire um, site uh, next door that the, uh, Vicky, Vicky Joe's yard gets shadowed um, for for a long period of time. It's nine o'clock is that is the one on the right, I think. Maybe it's earlier. Uh, but anyway, it, it it showed that it wasn't as big of an impact as one would fear. Uh, a bunch of these uh, floor plans that show. The plans being fairly, fairly decent and generous, and then our uh, rendering that shows um, the building. And because of the perforation, is the reason we did this drawing, just to show how light is going to come through the perforation, and give it some uh, interesting nuance between the day and the night. And um, we are pretty uh, excited about it. Um, and um, hopefully uh, you are too, and we hear some positive response. That was about all I had. Questions? I have a few questions, oh, sure. um, and I'm, I'm thinking that some of your, your um, the guests that visited today from um, Transform and the uh, landscape architecture may be able to answer these questions. Um, um, the first question is about the EV charging stations. Um, I'm really curious about the um, EV ready and what that means for residents that would like to use an EV car in the future. We're going to install three charging stations. Okay, so three charging stations. Excellent. 
Um, the follow-up question is for Transform. Um, I'm, I'm curious, um, is there a, a, a element that includes EV charging uh, stations as part of the Green tri Trip certification? Okay. Um, the I answer see was no. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, and the, go ahead. Chair Donaldson, may I ask a mm -hmm. clarifying question? Yeah. Um, were you planning to actually install charging stations or just three spaces to be EV ready? Mm -hmm. That's not the same thing. No, we're going to have the plugs in. So you have the full? Uh, yes. Okay, we need to amend that condition then. Yeah, okay. That's, that's better. If you are assigning parking spaces and you have tenants moving in and moving out and you only have three that are EV accommodating, how are you going to manage that? That's really a good question. We, <laughs> we are, have asked that the parking be unbundled, not right. attached to the units. So um, we are going to have to find out who is going to have an electric vehicle and who doesn't? And um, when, if if we get a tenant come in uh, later that has an electric vehicle, and then we have already rented their space, we're going to have to write in the first tenant's agreement that if we get a tenant with an electric vehicle, they have to move. So uh, I, they have to agree to relocate to another space if we have them available. So that's really a good question, um, Commissioner Donaldson. We don't know what we're going to do, but we wanted to, we want to have that right. because it's so. Ev everyone I know has an electric car these days. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Uh, the the green walls on the MacArthur side. Um, I, I'm interested in hearing from the landscape architect whether uh, there's any concern that those will would have any problem thriving. Well, we certainly wouldn't want a dead one, would we? Oh. <laughs> so we're going to have, we'll probably have drip irrigation to make sure that they're um, viable mm -hmm. and that we'll have a separate valve for those. Um, we will also pick some fairly sturdy species, which we have not done yet. Okay, and, and for that side of the building, I, I wouldn't anticipate a lot of sunlight hitting the, right. the plant. So. Well, like polystictum would be a, a good one. The Western store, Sword Fern, mm -hmm. which is uh, thrives in, at the San Francisco MoMA. Um, and I think it's one of the few ones that has thrived in that, uh, on that green wall. And it gets quite a bit of shade there too. Got it. And, and so you're thinking ferns on the, that? I think so. Some, n not, not like maidenhair ferns, but mm -hmm. really the, the, the hardier um, native ferns. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Other questions? No. I, I do have a question about the roof deck garden. Um, just, <laughs> just a short one. The details just showed uh, 18 inch planters and you've got olive trees. Can you talk about how you're going to treat those? And well, I, I believe that the uh, olive tree. Trees and shrubs. Well, yeah, I, the olive tree will need more than 18 inches, yeah. and we know that. Uh -huh. um, we will have to augment that. Um, at some points, we have um, installed um, larger planters within a planter mm -hmm. so that it gives the height and it gives some interest, too. So we, we just haven't finished our, our drawings yet. Yeah, I just want to make sure that in a number of these places we end up with these enormous planters that just make things feel hemmed absolutely. in. Absolutely. So I would love absolutely. to see a combination yeah. of yeah. heights and yeah. wanted to make sure that yeah. that gets done. Absolutely. Good question. Okay. Thank you. Do you have questions? Um, I just have a question. Actually, I might for the might be for the landscape architect again, but um, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think I think actually it was a, a question about just if you can walk us through kind of how long it'll take for each of these green elements to grow up, because I, I think that's an important element of sort of thinking of the timing of the development. So you have street trees and you have green walls and you have roof deck planted and are there different time frames for when those will be at maturity or you know 
how large are they coming in? You know, like that question sure, about the sure. new. Sure, that's a really that's a really fair question. Um, the the street trees um, are the the pears along Adeline, and they'll be put in at 15 gallon. The reason we decide to do that versus a 24 inch box is that they grow really fast. Um, I put in some five gallons in in front of my office building that I bought at Jack London Square, and they grew about five feet a year and I only watered them three times in 13 years <laughs> so I was trying to sort of really do use them as a test case um, I think the Ulnus parvifolia which is the Drake elm are going to go in at 24 inch box tree at 24 inch box and they will be you know 9 to 11 feet high when they're first installed again they're a fast growing tree um, the shrubs are um, mainly um, Five gallon, especially along the street, because if you don't put if you put in one gallon, they tend to walk away in the night. So on the roof garden, we are putting in the olive trees, the fruitless olive trees. We're putting in it at 24 inch box, also, and uh, the Circus canadensis that we've got one um, eastern red bud. We're putting that at. 24 inch box uh, again these are you know our plant material list has shrunk in years because of the watering requirements and you know the the option for recycled water to come in so we're really careful about the species that we plant um, so I think they're going to it's almost better to plant them smaller than larger um, because they will adapt to the environment and to the soil conditions and to the wind and whatnot. Um, so the olive tree will be in a, in a planter and I'm not going to tell you that it's going to grow as fast as it would in the ground. That would be a lie. Uh, they, but they will be installed at 24 inch box um, and they'll be contained and, and they're fairly if you've ever seen, if you've ever gone to Europe and seen them along the banks in Spain, there's thousands and thousands of them. They are very resilient plant material. So I think they're a good plant for a roof garden situation in a planter. Have I answered your questions? I think so, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. I didn't want to go into each plant material, but I just wanted to give you the general range. Yeah, just the overview. I did, um, one, one more thing. I know that the Pyrus cultivar is somewhat fire blight resistant, but do you have concerns about the Pyrus? With the you know, I have seen fire blight this year, uh, Gail. Um, it's been on mine. So. Yeah, and the two out front of my office, they're not, they're not looking great. I don't, if you have another suggestion, I'm willing to look at that. Um, I did want to have a fast-growing mm -hmm. uh, deciduous tree that would give some seasonal color in the spring and then in the fall um, and wouldn't do a lot of damage to the sidewalk. So that was the reason I tried this, did this tried and true. Um, it, you know, it's almost you want to put in something fairly large so it shades the building and, yeah. you know. So if you have another suggestion, I'm I'm open to not off the top of my head, yeah, but if I, you think I, of something, I, I will. I will. I will make a, a note of, of that. Yeah, yeah, that's a good, mm -hmm. good point. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other? I'm going to sit down. <laughs> you get to sit down now. <laughs> it's all right. No, this is okay. Um, this is a public hearing. I'm going to open the public hearing. If there's anyone wishing to speak. Okay. Good evening, commissioners. No matter how many times I'm up here, this still feels uncomfortable being so <laughs> short. Um, my name is Nina Rizzo, and I manage Green Trip Certifications at Transform. We're a nonprofit committed to transportation and land use solutions, and we believe everyone should have access to healthy and affordable communities and commutes. 
Green Chip certification recognizes multifamily developments that reduce parking, traffic, and greenhouse gas emissions. One of our program's goals is to see more housing for people rather than housing for cars. So my evaluation of this project demonstrates that it meets Green Trip standards in the following ways that do not include anything about EVs. <laughs> the first one is a parking ratio of less than one space per unit. The second is two traffic reduction strategies. The first being unbundled parking, which separates paying for parking uh, separate from paying from rent. And the second is free or deeply discounted AC transit passes for 40 years. There's at least one secure long-term bike parking space and 20% of guest bike parking spaces, as Madhu mentioned earlier. And the last one is daily household driving projected to be 50% less than the regional average. In addition, the project will provide an on-site bicycle repair station and sidewalk expansion, which makes biking and walking safer and easier. And the high level of transit service in the area means that people won't necessarily need a personal vehicle to get around. Uh, within a five minute walk, there's a thousand buses on eight routes and a thousand shuttles on two routes throughout the day. Uh, so I just would like to say that Adeline Spring is a welcome addition to the Green Trip family of projects. I respectfully recommend you approve it and I can answer any questions you have related to traffic and parking. Thank you. Questions? No? Okay, anyone else wishing to speak on this? Okay, close the public hearing. Bring it back to the commission for any discussion. I, I do have one other question. Um, the telephone pole that you were talking about that's on the corner in front of the building, it's not showing in the rendering. Is that something that is going to be removed? <laughs> um. I had a very preliminary conversation with PG&E uh, before we bought the property about what um, the undergrounding would look like. And um, the, he wasn't sure because the electric power comes from across the street, the, mm -hmm. the, the transformers. So whether th they would bring the new service undergrounded across Adeline and then come up to a transformer on the sidewalk or not, we're not sure or they will just bring power from the existing pool to the building, as it is now, mm -hmm. to a transformer. So I don't have an answer for you. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Well, do you have comments or uh, questions? You want to start? <laughs> I'm going to take a while. Okay. <laughs> might as well. Hmm? I, if you want, I can start. I was just going to go ahead. Yeah. Um, I'm probably going to need to have Maru come up again. Um, I'm having some difficulty with the community benefits um, program, so I want to kind of get into that a little deeper. And what we probably want to do is put on the screen uh, the plan page A2.1. <clears throat> so while you're coming up, um, I'm concerned that um, Having doing this in my day-to-day -day work um, and observing it everywhere, it seems like no project comes in under budget. Every project comes in over budget. I've never seen a project of this side say, hey man, we have tens of thousands of dollars available. So uh, what I'm wondering is does the city in its projections or the projections it work for have a contingent per percent that they add to a project? Say you do some research for doing the work on MacArthur and it comes in at 250,000, do you have a 10% contingency on top of that? Are the numbers you're giving us including a, ten, a contingency of any type? No, there is no contingency involved. So the 256 that we're looking at, I'm concerned with it doing everything that we're wanting, meaning all of the stuff on MacArthur and some street improvements on on um, Adeline. So. Um, I, overall, I, I, I like the project, I have no problem approving it. I'm just this community benefit thing is kind of a, a loose thing for me since we can't do the undergrounding. So I want to get my hands wrapped around. So on this image here, looking along Adeline Street, there's two bump outs um, that come into the parking area. Are those included as part of the um, budget for the developer to do those or would that be part of this community benefit? It would not be part of the community benefit. So, so the street frontages uh, the building frontages on the street and all the improvements on the sidewalk are as part of the project. Okay, so these trees going out into the street would all be All that part you of see is not part of the community benefits. Okay, 
Okay, so that's not an added thing then. Okay, that's good. So I, I would just, I don't know how we, or even we, we can do this tonight because it seems like you guys don't quite know, but um, I, want, I want to talk to the commission and see how we do this. That I just want to make sure that we don't get something half finished. That we either fund all of MacArthur and just call it a day, and if we have 10,000 left, we give it to the community benefit thing. I don't, I don't want to approve a project thinking we're going to do all of MacArthur and then maybe something on Adeline or without having a clear plan of what that would be. And I don't think, since we don't have a contingent percent in this project, I'm leery of approving too much. May, and may I make a suggestion? Um, I think the uh, estimate of the amount of the community benefit is about a quarter of a million dollars, if I'm not mistaken. 256. And that will... Um, vary of course when it's five percent of construction valuation and construction valuation is not an exact science so when they apply for their building permit that is when the construction valuation gets nailed down although sometimes it even changes during construction but typically we have a better handle on it at that time so we're assuming it's going to be about 256 the estimate for just the curb gutter and sidewalk uh, along the entire length of West MacArthur Boulevard was a, a little over 90,000, I think. And that included the building property frontage. So we estimated that the portion that would be good for the community benefits would be the other part of the block, which is about 45,000. That is significantly less than the 256 that they're required to provide. But as Mira said, it did not include uh, street trees or landscaping, um, you know, or I think a uh, street light. Oh, street lights. Street lights. So that would probably bring it up closer to the 256. Now, we've also included in there repaving of the street and the reconfiguration of the travel lanes. Uh, the reconfiguration of the travel lanes probably doesn't cost very much. That's just striping. Um, the repaving of the street could kick it up, though, above the 256. So I would suggest that when we, when that you, you defer to staff to get estimates for all these things, I'm pretty confident that they can do the curb gutter sidewalk and street trees within the 256, um, and hopefully the, the street light too, although as Muir said, if that blows the budget, then we wouldn't include that. If this paving exceeds the 256, then we just wouldn't do that part. Does that satisfy you? Well, I, I guess I'm trying to, I'm trying, I sort of have some similar concerns, but I'm, I'm trying to figure out whether you get, you know, a high quality mm -hmm. sidewalk at the end of the day. Um, and the, the idea that things may or may not appear, um, you know, it, it sort of makes me wonder, you know, are you actually going to get what you think you're going to get? Um, and so I, I think your explanation helped in terms of curb gutter street trees maybe lighting like so that's a more comprehensive understanding of that um and so i think the question i have for the commission is really that question about you know is that the kind of sidewalk is that the d design guideline public realm that we're looking for um because certainly there's you know there is that question about paving curb uh kinds of paving street furniture you know that the sidewalk can have many <laughs> other things in it so so i think that that was that was sort of where I was left, not having a full sense of what that sidewalk is. Well, the Emeryville design guidelines, which were adopted by the city council <coughs> on recommendation of the planning commission before you were on the commission, uh, includes a cross-section of uh, what the sidewalk should be, including the pa pedestrian pathway and the platter strip and all that kind of thing. And this sidewalk expansion has been designed to comply with those guidelines. Um, so hopefully it would be what we're looking for. So could you add including some planting? Including okay. planting? Because I don't see any planting on the plants so far. Right. That's we said in the conditions that a planter strip should be added okay. with street trees. So could we get a rundown of of what the condition of approval is requiring so far for the um, the MacArthur side, so I can say, okay, I, I can approve that. If you could uh, refer to page five of the conditions of approval, <coughs> staff report. So are we looking at the bullet point items? 
So we're looking, yeah, where it says uh, B number two, public improvements. Okay, I'm looking at Planning Commission Staff Report, Adeline Springs, page five of 18. Conditions oh, of approval. Oh, I'm sorry. Five of 30. It's public yeah, improvements. Five of okay. <clears throat> Project site fronting Peralta Street. Between the project between the project site frontage and Peralta Street. So street trees repaving the street, including reconfiguration to put parking lane on the right side, adjacent to the sidewalk, and travel lane on the left side. Uh, and widening the sidewalk, of course. That's the main thing. Um, and then it references the Emeryville design guidelines, gives the dimensions for the sidewalk and the planter strip, um, notes that it would mean the curb would move out about two to three feet. Give and no, no bonus points for anything along their own frontage. Do you have a sense of the, the length? Hmm? I'm sorry. Oh, the street light? No, the, the length that this would apply to. Uh, the linear dimension yeah. it's uh, it's a little over half the block I think it was uh, 110 feet yeah 110 feet about but I mean these improvements would be done along the entire block they don't only get bonus points though for the 110 feet that's to the west of their site do we need to put that in the conditions of approval since it's not showing on the drawings w which the trees and the planter strip. Well, the planters, planter strip and trees are there. Doesn't it say that? Yeah. Well, for the... For the frontage. Oh, for their for, frontage. For their frontage. Oh, oh, Yeah, because oh. the plants don't have those. If you look at L1. I think, actually, I think I had it under the, under the uh, public improvement section. Where is that? So that's in a different section of the conditions. Uh, it's the standard condition for public <coughs> improvements. It's on page 14. Oh, okay. So this is, this is not bonus points. This is just a normal requirement. New curb gutter sidewalk on Adeline and West MacArthur. Um, landscaping, irrigation to meet bay friendly requirements. New street trees, minimum 24 inch box. Uh, the bulb out, the crosswalk, repaving West MacArthur and the adjacent, adjacent to the project site and reconfiguring it to put the parking lane next to the sidewalk. So we tried to make this match what they're doing for the bonus points. Okay. So Charlie, run me through the process. So, so we do these um, improvements and this is obviously is the, the first part of the take of the budget that we take. And then you have money left over is that when you decide to come around to adeline street and make any additional improvements no staff is not re recommending any bonus points to be used on adeline street okay that was a recommendation that i think was offered by the applicant right now okay. regarding the street light on adeline if there's any money left over but as it is right now staff is not recommending any funds going on adeline street okay okay i think that's maybe what brought on some confusion for me Okay, I think I'm a little better. <laughs> yeah, I think that was helpful, and, and there was a big discrepancy between those and, and the drawings, and I think that's you know definitely a factor. Right, mm -hmm. right. These improvements are not shown on the drawings, um, and that's why we have a standard condition right at the beginning that says uh, references the approved plans. It says as modified by these conditions. Sure. Great. That's all the questions I have or comments. I think, though, uh, based on this discussion, we need to add to the memo that Miru handed you uh, uh, street lights on um, West MacArthur Boulevard as for the bonus points. 
if if it can be done within the budget. Okay. Yeah, so we'll include a street light as part of a bonus points. And you guys have a, a hierarchy, you're gonna do this and then this and then this and then if money is left over we do that? The way I imagine this happening is them giving us a line item of each of the different features okay. and then whatever makes sense in terms of what the costing is. Okay. Uh, I think that's how it would. Is there, but how is there would the telephone pole be treated? Yeah, that's what, is there a priority? This is really important. We need to make sure we have them funding for this and we need Telephone to make sure they're funding for well, that. The, pole, the electrical pole that gets the electricity from the <coughs> east side of the street that's in front of the building right now that, <coughs> that the applicant said that, they didn't know whether it would be there or not. It, on their side of the street? Yeah. That would not be worth bonus points. Right, but how is that treated if apparently we don't know whether that is planned to remain or not it's showing right here on this drawing is remaining there's a little round thing there i think that's a pg e thing isn't it do you want to add a condition that it shall be removed if possible or something like that sure i don't know get rid of it if possible uh, so like use extra money from the bonus but not points bonus. No, no no not that's bonus. not oh, okay that's not for bonus points that's on their frontage <clears throat> but do we know what the cost of that is? Well, that doesn't matter. Oh. Because that's not part of the bonus point calculation. Okay. I mean, it matters to the applicant. <laughs> it doesn't matter <laughs> that's to what us. I'm <laughs> <laughs> Are we adding a million dollars to there? <laughs> well, that's if, if, if feasible. Yes. It is, a, it is something that's out of our control. PG&E... Uh, will have to investigate and tell us whether it, they can remove it or not. And um, and I, I presume there's um, quite a bit of cost if they have to trench across the street and bring the service underground as opposed to take power from the pole. So this is a fairly small project and as you as is as presented in the staff report, uh, we're paying the city $750,000, including the community benefit fees. Uh, the city is receiving five affordable units, 24 rental market rate units, and six uh, live work units. So we, we hope that you recognize that in, in a rising construction cost environment and leveling and declining rents, if you put too many conditions that make this project infeasible, it may not be built. So I would... Uh, plead with you not to make that a requirement, but rather allow us to work with the staff that if it is possible to do it within the community benefit, we would like to do that. But if it is not, I hope that you will not make that a condition. How does the commissioners feel about that? I think this just kind of came out of the blue tonight that and to add that as a condition without knowing the cost of doing that and I agree that that might be the point of PG&E bringing in the power and if and if we want something done differently trenching across that line and etc could be an ex, ex cost that wasn't budgeted so I I think if look at it if it's possible I I can't support making it a condition I, I agree with that um, I mean I I think from the beginning, I've known that the trenching would be quite costly. Uh, it doesn't surprise me, the numbers you're getting. Um, so I think they're making a good faith effort to make it as, as uh, nice as possible in the public realm. So I like, I like that. Um, and I, Yeah, and I wouldn't want to see it get hooked on that. I, I agree with both uh, Commissioner Stephen and uh, Christine. Okay. All right, does someone have a motion then? Well, I, I did want to, uh, I, I wanted to actually sort of, this is a comment moment. Um, I, I really like the project. It's a fabulous project. Um, it's a great, like, urban, low parking ratio, tight building, you know, interesting facade project. So I really appreciate that. Um, the one thing that I'll say, and I don't think it's really f for you, I think it's a broader statement about um, sustainability and, uh, and how to integrate that in an urban environment. Um, the question about do you understand the energy, do you understand the shadow and the climate implications, um, I don't feel like that's demonstrated. Um, and so there's just a, a larger question for good urban projects out there. 
um, in terms of making sure that the, the shadow study is accurate. There are some inaccuracies that I'm seeing. Um, you guys have a great site. You don't cast a lot of shadow. I get that. That's great. <laughs> um, and in terms of your efforts with the neighbors, that's really great to see too. Um, other things though, in terms of just the word, using the word clima climatic rather than climactic, um, that there's, a, there's a, a rigor around the environmental thing that, that is, is missing with good urban projects. You're getting a lot of environmental effort through the Good Urban Project, which I appreciate. Um, so this might be just a larger conversation for the city about how to enhance that rigor in these kinds of projects. Um, so I just wanted to lay that out as a comment, but overall, I, this is a great project. Um, I also agree. I, I, I like the design. I appreciate how um, after the first um, study session you came back and um, you totally revamped the design. Um, I, I'm more partial to this now. Um, I like and the colors and I think that they complement each other. Uh, specifically the perforated um, one that lets light through. Um, I think that's going to add a lot of interest. Um, so I'm excited to see that come together. Um, the, um, the, I, I'm, a, I'm a little disappointed with the EV stations um, being only three as opposed to the whole parking lot. Um, I understand the limitations with cost. Um, I'd love to see um, transform, include EV spaces as part of the uh, requirements. Um, so um, hopefully that can come together uh, in the future. Uh, let's see, the, the, the green wall, um, early on you made that change because you've heard feedback from the commission um, that we wanted to see less uh, murals and more living walls. Um, I, 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 you listened, um, but I, I, I still love the, the murals um, and would love to see more of that, specifically on the side that's not going to see a lot of sunlight. It, just, it really bums me out to ride through the city here and see all these living walls that are not living. <laughs> and, and so um, that's the front of the building and, and um, I'd, I'd hate for the, the walls to, um, to not um, really welcome the guests as well as they can. Um, so have some reservations with that. Um, the, this, the widening of sidewalks, um, great um, um, to include that um, as part of the, the, the project. Uh, pedestrian safety is something that, I'm, that I really care about. Um, so if the lights on Adeline Street are at all possible, um, I, I would like to see the, the, in, um, the light increase there um, as it, it can be a dark corridor for pedestrians. <clears throat> um, no, nope, those are my comments. Um, I'm, I'm ready to move forward with this. Yeah. Okay. Want to make motion then? Well, I, I think that we have a, a condition of approval that, to change for the EV stations, and so um, yeah. we, I, I'm comfortable moving forward with the, um, with the project and make a motion to approve it with that condition being amended. I second that. We had, uh, just to remind the commission, you had two I believe two modifications to the conditions. One was uh, in, in Miru's <coughs> memo here, it said all, uh, three vehicular parking stalls shall be electric vehicle charging station ready, and we're gonna strike ready and just say it's charging stations. Mm. The other was to add a street light for bonus points on West MacArthur Boulevard, if that can be done within the bonus point budget, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so th that's your motion with those two changes to the conditions? Yes. I'll second it. And Commissioner Thompson second it, yes, okay. Uh, let's see, Commissioner Guerrero? Aye. Commissioner Keller? Aye. Commissioner Thompson? Aye. And Chair Donaldson? Aye. Four ayes, the application is approved. This decision may be appealed to the City Council within 15 days. I do wanna thank you for your responsiveness to our comments and to working with your neighbors on making it work for them too, and I hope that the wall back there works out. Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> Next item on the agenda, Ocean View Townhomes has been continued to a future meeting. So the last of our public hearings is the sprint antennas on the water tower. This is just going to take me a moment to set up here. Hmm. 
watch that guy. Okay, I'm ready when you are. I think we're ready. Good evening, commissioners. So this is the presentation on the Sprint antennas on the water tower at 1255 Powell Street. So here is the site location. It's bound by Powell Street to the north, Doyle to the west, Beaudry to the east, and Stanford to the south. There is highlighted in red. And the water tower itself is on the corner of Powell and Doyle. So for background, the water tower is host to multiple antennas for several co-located wireless companies. The antennas and support equipment are located on the legs of the water tower and are painted to match the structure. And the equipment cabinets that support the antennas are located on the south side of the property next to the office building in the site. And those are completely screened from view by the fence. So that is not part of the review tonight. It's just the water tower itself. But I will be showing some pictures for context of the full project. So unless, something is, unless the antennas are completely hidden from public view, uh, the current planning regulations require planning commission approval for wireless communication facilities. And the Sprint facilities were uh, originally approved before that, so they were done administratively back in 2004 and modifications in 2011. So the request tonight is due to an increased demand for cellular, cellular speed and coverage, and that necessitates either an increase in antenna size or an increase in the number of antennas. The applicant is opting for an increase in size of the existing antennas. Uh, to, it's more spatially efficient and reduces impacts visually. So for the project overview, it's to replace the three existing antennas. Uh, the new antennas are about uh, 30 inches taller than the existing ones and about seven inches wider. Uh, there's a total of six supportive RRH units that will be installed behind each of the antennas, as well as new cables uh, that will run up the legs. All the pro proposed equipment will be painted to match the existing water tower structure. And as I mentioned before, the other equipment that's supportive is not visible from public view. So we have a site plan here showing the water tower and the support equipment area to the back of the building. So we'll take a quick look at the back of the building, just so you have an idea. There's uh, the equipment. Uh, cabinets there that are changing a little bit and that's what it looks like hidden completely from public view and then the actual water tower, tower itself on the corner and uh, the existing is on the left here the proposed is on the right there's three legs of the tower with equipment with the southeast leg it does not have any proposed equipment or anything new on it so there's some existing images of the water tower and the equipment it's about 63 feet off the ground uh, what we're looking at here. And there's some little arrows indicating the actual antennas on the legs. And here's a view from the northeast corner of Powell Street, kind of zooming in uh, a little bit closer each picture there. And then across here from the east. So from proposed, this is facing Powell Street, so the north side. To kind of help you highlight and uh, make it a little bit easier to see here is the new one on the right side and an existing would be on the left. And then facing Doyle, so this is facing the park on Powell. This would be the view. So again, highlighting the area that we're looking at here, about 63 feet off the ground. And uh, there's the new antenna. So here's a north elevation. I didn't circle these ones, so this is a little bit like, can you spot the differences? So we have the, uh, here the existing, and then on the right side the proposed. So you can see that it's a little bit taller than the existing antenna. And then the east elevation, you can see the Beaudry Street sign there. Again, here's the existing one, and the proposed is a little bit taller. So major design review findings need to be made for these antennas. The design of the project is consistent with the general plan. The design of the project conforms to the Emeryville design guidelines, and the project is of a design quality that's compatible with and will not adversely affect the surrounding area. 
So staff's recommendation is to approve the project. The applicant is here, Natalia Jepson. Oh, there you are. If you have any questions as well. There's also, you should have received some communications uh, on your dais and by email earlier today from uh, the public, from a neighbor. I have a question of our, um, w is, are there any limits to how many, um, s how many we can put on this water tower? Um, it's starting to have a quite a collection there. <laughs> yeah, there haven't been any new ones added for quite some time. I went back and looked at the building permit history mm -hmm. and the most recent building permits were from 2015 for upgrading equipment, uh, so not expanding it. Again, this is not adding more antennas, it's just adding to the existing size and exact same location. Mm -hmm. um, anything that were to be added would have to come here again. And uh, I imagine there's a limit, not so much, uh, perhaps the applicant could speak more to this than me, but you know, when we've been looking at other antennas on public utility poles, there's a limit to how many can be there because of the capacity of the pole and how close things are allowed to be together and their supportive equipment. And that's a limiting factor, but there isn't, you know, in our code, like X number per Y square footage. So that's part of why there's a design review component to this. Thank you. Sure. So I'm looking at um, sheet A21 that has a top-down view of the new equipment, and it looks like there are other pieces of equipment that are that I'm not seeing on the photo sims. Can can you explain what those pieces look like? Yeah, let's just go to that sheet. And write down. Of course, I put up the entire <laughs> staff report, not just the right. photo sims. But let's get there. You said, I'm sorry, sheet A 2.21. 2.1. Almost there. Getting there. Working close. Thanks for your patience. Let's make this a little bit bigger. Ah, oh. oh, it was a tease. False alarm. <laughs> So a lot of work has gone into this. <laughs> I can see that. There we go. All right. A 2.1. All right. So the things that seem to be represented in the photo simulation are the new pieces on the outer side, and then mm -hmm. there's these things behind them that look like they're bulky, but I don't. I, I don't see. Under, I don't see them. Okay. How they're represented on the photo sims. So let's go back to the. Oh, the photo sims on here. I see, so you're saying they're not shown behind I, here? I don't know what, they're, what they actually look like. Maybe this is something you're able the applicant to speak to that? Address. Yeah. You need to come up to the microphone. microphone. Those are called um, remote radio heads, and they're located behind the antennas. So normally you can't really see them that much, but from the angle, that the antenna is facing, you shouldn't be able to to see them. So that's why they weren't represented. So in the pictures we're looking at, on the picture on the right-hand side, on the left leg of the tower, there's a red arrow showing the item, mm -hmm. the antenna. Behind that, there's a couple of square things. Is that, are those what we're seeing in the drawing, or are those? Those are what you're seeing in the drawing, yes. Okay, so Gail, does that make more sense to you? Well, if I look at the A3 one, they seem to be inboard of the legs of the tower, uh, which is another mm. another visual intrusion. Right, no, I think right here, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I think you yeah, need to go back there. up. A3 one? I think you need to go yeah, back, yeah. Yeah, A3 one, right where your little hand was. Here, that's... Here. Yeah. That seems to be much more prominent than what was on the left-hand side, mm -hmm. the existing side. And that's how it's reading on the other side. The elevation drawings here are kind of facing this way, but the photos are taken from the ground level at an angle. Mm -hmm. So that should be how you're, you're looking at it from that point of view on the ground level, <clears throat> if that makes sense. <clears throat> I'm not totally convinced. Okay. Does anyone else have questions for the applicant? Yeah. I, well, I'm, this is sort of a larger question, uh, but it it 
sort of is, is related to this idea of always more antennae. Um, mm -hmm. I'd like to know sort of for the operating capacity and what you see into the future. Yeah. Um, I, I am getting the sense that they have to be a certain distance from each other um, and they have to have a directionality to it. Mm -hmm. um, but they are they are reaching sort of a fever pitch of clutter mm -hmm. <laughs> at this point. Yeah. So what's the future look like? Is this ever going to get slimmer or smaller or? Well, I'm not sure what the future holds, but I know that this specific these specific antennas are they're larger because they are a completely new technology. They're called MIMO antennas, which is uh, multiple in, multiple out. So they use more, um, they have more signals that can come in and out rather than these antennas, which is just one signal in, one signal out. And this actually creates um, less need to add antennas over time. So these will be, and these antennas also will work with future technology. Um, we're, you know, all, all the carriers are getting ready to do, the, you know, 5G, which is going to, it's going to service, um, you know, automated vehicles. And so there's going to be a need for high capacity data and these will work with the future technology. So, okay. So, so they are relatively efficient because your capacity is increasing two to three times or yes. more. I, how, how much is your capacity? No, increasing? I'm not, I don't exactly have the okay. exact numbers, but, um, I, I just know it's a different technology and it, it a, holds a lot more capacity, so. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? No. All right, it's a public hearing. So if there's anyone from the public wishing to speak, we do have a letter from a member of the public, but I see no one wishing to speak now. So I'll close the public hearing. What are your thoughts? Aside from that, they're not very attractive and they're bigger. Um. One thing is they don't look as bad as the antenna behind Ikea, that one that sticks up the silver thing with all the radio heads hanging <laughs> off of it. I mean, that thing's god awful. At least this is hidden up. But Charlie, I had asked that um, in speaking about the email, I had asked that you have somebody speak to us about the health issues and what we're really allowed to to listen to and discuss and Navar, were you able to address that or did you want to address that, Andrea? I'll let Navar. Okay. Um, well I went back uh, and looked at the report that the applicant provided. And that's not the right document. Well, while Navarre is looking for the document, I can provide you with some of the regulatory framework, which is the federal government um, regulates the, what's it, the radio frequency admissions. And as long as they show that they're in compliance with the federal regulations, <coughs> the city can't impose any additional conditions. We're preempted from regulating that. So. We just, we ask for um, documentation to show that they're complying, and I believe they've submitted that. That's the report that Navarre is looking for. So if I can in the future, because this came up during the AT&T light pole study mm -hmm. session we had several months ago, because I know there are federal regulations that restrict us. And so if in the future when we have these things, if we can have a memo explaining that this is what the federal regulations allow, and what we as a commission are allowed to look at, because this person's several emails is very directed at health concerns. And I know that, I don't know the details, but I know at some point we're limited to what we can approve or not approve in relation to health things. So if we can get a memo that says that this is what the federal relations allow, this is what is being met by the applicant, then that way we know that that's a consideration that's been taken as far as we can take it and that we're, um, not and, doing our due diligence and paying attention and, to and those. And our planning regulations um, have been drafted in a way that um, implements sort of what the city is allowed to do. So one of the things the planning regulations do does is have the applicant submit it, um, and then when it relates to findings that the planning commission makes, those are findings that 
the Planning Commission makes that are allowed under both federal and state law. So our planning regulations have been modernized and account for the various layers of federal and state law. And the, the thing uh, I'm just considering is we are having quite a turnover of, of commissioners and just to make sure that they know. I, know. I think for future applications, it would be useful to have a paragraph in the staff report that summarizes the, that would be. the, state, the federal and state law and what the commission can and cannot regulate. Perfect, that's what I'm asking for. Okay, thanks. Uh, so as for, for this uh, particular project, on page three of their uh, report, it looks like this. There was a little sticky note on it. It says Radio Frequency Emissions Report. Uh, it's by Hammett and Edison, Inc., Consulting Engineers. On page three of that report at the top, it talks about the study results. And it says, for a person anywhere at the ground, the maximum RF exposure level due to the proposed sprint operation by itself is calculated to be a number which is 0.55% of the applicable public exposure limit. The maximum calculated cumulative level at ground for the simultaneous operation of all four carriers, so all carriers on the water tower, is 2.6% of the public exposure limit. The maximum calculated cumulative level at any nearby building is 10% of the public limit. It should be noted that these results include several worst case assumptions and therefore expected to overstate actual power density levels. So that's at the top of the page. If you drop down to the bottom of the page, so it carries over from page three to page four, the last sentence says, the highest calculated level in publicly accessible areas is much less than the prevailing standards allow for exposures of unlimited duration. So one of the concerns raised in the letter was this is this just for someone going up and changing equipment? Is this just for walking by on the street as a temporary thing? What about people who are living here all the time? And this explicitly states for unlimited duration. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm not so much worried about the frequency questions because I think that they were answered sufficiently. It's just the clutter questions that I'm concerned about. Um, and whether the representations were, were accurate, considering what, what I'm looking at on the drawings. I mean, I know that technology is moving along. I'm just wondering whether it can be more um, integrated with the structure so that it's not increasing the clutter. Yeah, and I, I think that's something that the commission has, has sort of asked of other utility um, providers in general. Um, and it's been a topic of conversation before about the question about how to make this as slim as possible. If it's really truly backgrounding, can you, can you enhance the design to background? And getting larger and getting bigger and adding more stuff doesn't do that. Um, that's why I asked about the efficiency. It's great to hear that relative to the gains you're getting, that these are actually not increasing, you know, parametrically. <laughs> um, but, the, but I do think that question about um, is there a way to make it less invasive or alternatively to, to make it a feature and display it, that this is an important component of the community. Um, and that it, it, you know, I have the same question about whether it's being fully addressed as in that way. Yeah, um, so for this uh, project, I don't believe we're adding another, um, another anything to this tower that's, that's not already there. Yeah, just yes, okay. Um, and so um, that said, um, this is something I can support. Um, however, I am concerned with um, any additional um, any additions that we make to this. Um, before this came to the commission, um, I was in the neighborhood um, and actually admiring this structure. Um, and uh, my admiration um, wasn't uh, impacted by the things that were there already. Um, and so um, I don't see this impacting um, the, the view of how it looks now. Um, but I am concerned with um, us adding more uh, to that in the future. It all right. <laughs> Thanks, Charlie. <laughs> I'll, I'll flip you for it. Um, uh, Andrea is reminding me that the planning regulations do encourage co-location. Mm -hmm. So the, the desire is to have these things located together rather than dispersed all over the place. Got it. So. Thank you. 
But I would echo the sentiments that, you know, do we end up completely concealing these things in antennas or does there come a point where it's got enough on it and we have to look at further places? So I think, and that's going to be, I think, up for us mm -hmm. that we'd say, you know what, this has got enough. You need to find a place on the roof of, you know, park on Pell or something like that. So, so I agree. So the, the one thing I would ask in, um, addressing uh, Chair Donaldson's concerns is that the the units that support this, the antenna itself, I would ask that you guys put those in a location to where it is as behind or concealed from it and the antenna. Because this is a vantage from at least Boudry Street and Powell, it's going to be hard to completely hide it. You're going to see it from somewhere. But I, I would ask that when you guys do the installation, that the units that go behind the antenna, that you try to conceal those, make them as close to um, the color of the the support columns and everything that you can. Um, I agree. This it it it's, gets very cluttered, and um, it's all necessary equipment. Of course, we wouldn't install anything that's not necessary. But but just try to to clean it up and to make it as as neat and tidy as you can is what I think I would say. I think I agree. Is there a motion on it? Chair Donaldson, before uh, you do that, I just, I, I need, we can't remember if we heard you open and close the public hearing. Yes. I did. You did? Okay. I can do it again. That's Is there fine. anyone else it, from the public long, that wants to speak? As long as you said you did, that's you fine. Did. <laughs> closed. Okay. Well, uh, you know, I, <laughs> I mean, I, 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 at this point in time, due to the replacement, due to the, um, you know, due, due to the, the technology discussion we had earlier, I would move to approve this. I think I, the, I would, with the comments that, you know, that this is a reoccurring issue um, and that the commission will have to continue to be attentive to it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that, and, you know, so. I'll stop talking now. <laughs> Second. All right, moved by Commissioner Thompson and seconded by Commissioner Guerrero. Commissioner Guerrero? Aye. Commissioner Keller? Aye. Commissioner Thompson? Aye. And Chair Donaldson? Uh, reluctant, aye. <laughs> I think we need the technology, but. but or eyes, the application is approved. This decision may be appealed to the City Council within 15 days. Chair, can we take a five minute break? Okay. <laughs> five minute break.
Reconvening the Planning Commission meeting, we have one more item on the agenda, which is a study session for the AT&T small cell wireless um, facility. More antenna fun. <laughs> All those antennas everywhere. Yeah. Okay, so uh, you may recall this is similar to uh, a uh, item which from mobility, which was small cell antenna as well, uh, which for what a variety of reasons, which has nothing to do with the project itself, but person who was, who's been ill for a long time, that's why it hasn't returned, but it will be coming back. It's not dead. Uh, this is a new one. This is at and small cell wireless facility. And they are hoping to locate a small cell wireless telecommunication facility, those are the words in our code, on an existing street pole on Powell Street. This will be first of seven such facilities that will be proposed in Emeryville. Uh, the purpose is to provide AT&T uh, with the third and fourth generation uh, wireless service and data coverage and capacity to the surrounding area. So in terms of gap in coverage, uh, these are the existing conditions. Uh, green is excellent uh, coverage, and then yellow is not so much, uh, and green is worse. Now, uh, the black dots are the, uh, the seven that I mentioned. The one we are talking about today is right here on Powell. So uh, as you can see, this is in, in an area where the coverage is not good. And then if when you introduce them, then this is what happens. And that's and, and it's shown for other locations as well. Uh, so the location of the pole is right next to the honor bar uh, uh, on Powell Street. And so this is an existing 30 foot, uh, uh, 30 foot tall uh, pole. And they're going to be adding uh, this antenna on the top. This is about four and a half feet of shroud. So the antennas are inside it, and there it's covered by a shroud. And there are uh, equipment on the pole itself. This is the photo simulation of, uh, of, the, uh, of the project. And then staff asked uh, the applicant to give some alternatives to uh, this proposal. So they came up with three. One is showing it just without the shroud, so that you know it seems a little less prominent uh, than with the shroud. Depends on your viewpoint. This is a painting. There was a suggestion made uh, in terms of public art. Then how would that look? So they kind of used, you know, this typical um, uh, things that we see along uh, Hollis Street in terms of yellow and black. So that's an alternative for you to consider. And then uh, this doesn't show very clearly, but there is an existing sign. Uh, so they have put some of the equipment behind it. So it would not be visible from one side, but it would still be visible from here. So I'm going to show you a pictures of a similar antenna facility in the city. This is in the financial district. Uh, so th this is how it looks. And I'll give you different uh, viewpoints. So here is the shroud, and this is the equipment. And from another angle, this is what it looks like, uh, the close-up of the equipment. And here, of course, the shroud, that's where the shroud is, and a further close-up of this. So in terms of the permits that are required, it will need a use permit, a design review, and an encroachment permit from Public Works Department. And uh, so there are, you know, essentially the, we thought because uh, the commission was not very satisfied at, with the mobility in terms of options, we are bringing this first as a study session so that uh, we can take input and you can provide direction to uh, the applicant. So the questions before you are that are you satisfied with the appearance of the facility? Uh, what, what do you think of the alternative designs? Does the commission have any other ideas for alternative designs, or does the commission have any other issues or concerns about the proposed project? Uh, let's keep in mind the uh, little legal uh, disclosure that was talked about in the previous item. They, it applies here as well, just to make sure. The applicant is here. Uh, he does have a presentation. 
Uh, so either you can, if you have questions for me, I'll be happy to answer. Otherwise, I'm going to hand it over uh, to the applicant. Maru, um, I just have a question. If the city were to go through and change the pole type of the lights that we have here, whether it's a retrofit of LED, maybe a stronger pole, whatever, if we decide that we're going to go through the street and change this street pole, um, is are we required to uh, provide a pole that it would accommodate this antenna? And if we do move it and um, say remove pole A and put in pole B, are we required to fund them putting the antenna, taking the antenna off the old pole and putting it on the new one? So, if I may, Maru, um, when this would come forward for approval, one of the conditions of approval would be that. Uh, the applicant has to enter into a license agreement with the city and the license agreement would spell out what happens in those instances and um, our typical encroachment agreement so we have all sorts of stuff in the public right of ways if we have to go in and do something um, generally the the person who's encroaching in our right of way has to pay to have the facility moved but would we be under an obligation to provide space for that antenna again? Um, so that would be part of the terms and conditions of the license agreement, which okay. hasn't been drafted yet. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions? Okay. So I'll have the applicant come over and give the presentation. Thank you, Maria. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, my name is Matt Yurgovich. I work for uh, Vinculums. Vinculums is a uh, telecommunications developer, and we're working on behalf of AT&T to develop this small cell facility. Um, so um, I know that the commission has uh, seen a lot of uh, wireless facility proposals uh, even tonight and uh, we respect your diligence and your purview. Uh, these facilities are very important to the public. Uh, most folks these days rely exclusively on their cell phones. Uh, that is more than 50% of the population these days. They've cut their uh, landlines. Uh, the vast majority of 911 calls are from cell phones. Um, most people's jobs rely on their cell phones, whether it's uh, driving for Uber or um, you know, working from a home or whatever. Um, so uh, these facilities are very important. Uh, it's the new uh, utility. So uh, we definitely respect uh, your review. Um, what are small cells? Um, small cells are uh, flexible network solutions that uh, can be readily deployed. These things can be installed in about a day. Uh, we're talking about uh, essentially <coughs> Two remote radio units. You can, you know, barely see them behind the pole itself, uh, and then usually a disconnect switch that also you can't see. This is an actual installation with the exact same equipment that we're proposing um, in Emeryville. Um, they address essentially two things, and it can be a little, a little confusing. Um, so I'm going to focus on these two things as kind of like separate things. Um, and I have a, uh, I think we must have the, uh, the same cough, uh, Commissioner Keller, if you want to, uh, Greek a love, got, <laughs> I've got a bunch. Um, but uh, two, separate, two separate things that we're addressing here, and if you can keep these things distinct, um, I think it's important. Uh, one is coverage, uh, basically the ability to, to have a signal, and the other thing is capacity, okay? Um, so uh, I'm going to actually skip skip ahead briefly. You might have a, a, a macro site covering the broader area, a tower like you heard with the past agenda item, and uh, like a beacon of light on a hillside uh, casting light down upon the city is how that tower works with the um, you know, general coverage. And then you have small cells which like the street lights um, provide you with the light that you need to see uh, essentially to to, to do what you need to do, and similarly with uh, small cells. So you might have a, a, you know, walking down the street, you might have a coverage issue where you see that you have no bars. You might have a capacity issue if you see you have three or four bars, you place a call and it drops, 
or you're trying to um, you're trying to uh, I don't know if, you know communicate with your Uber driver and you can't or you're delayed in doing so. So um, both of those things are addressed um, by these proposals. Um, and I wonder if I can go back to the previous. I'll look at that. Um, so there are differences between the, the, you know, the cell towers, the macro sites, and the small cells. They are uh, both needed to meet the extreme demand that, uh, that there is on the networks these days. So it's not enough to have the, the macro sites. Um, you need the small cells to uh, make it so that you have coverage in your, uh, in your office, in your uh, apartment, you know, in the restaurant. Uh, next to which we're deploying this facility. Um, and then there are differences in terms of the, uh, obviously the size. I mean, what we're proposing is extremely small. Um, the, the, the power usage <coughs> is extremely, you know, much less. And the output is much less appropriate for, um, you know, for the, the needs that we're addressing. Oh, and I should mention also um, another major difference. Obviously, we're deploying in the, the, uh, the public right-of-way. And the public right-of-way is subject to uh, somewhat different rules. Uh, in particular, in California, there's uh, California, uh, California Public Utilities Code, Section 7901, uh, which deals with telephone and telegraph in the public right-of-way. It allows utilities like AT&T to have access to the right-of-way um, for these facilities. Um, not to be, you know, pushed onto private property, for example, uh, within time, place, and manner restrictions of the local jurisdiction and uh, aesthetics controls within those time, place, and manner restrictions. Um, so just to clarify, uh, Maru did a great job with the propagation maps, but I uh, wanted to clarify a few points. The green actually is where, the, um, where there is good service. Um, keep in mind that the... Um, these propagation maps are sort of breathing models. So they, they, you know, they capture kind of maybe a, a moment in time. But what they don't capture is the high um, capacity needs. So for example, maybe at 3 o'clock when school's letting out, or um, it sounds like uh, City of Emeryville is having a uh, fun uh, city event soon. So uh, at those events when there's high population, uh, there's a particular draw on the network. And so obviously the, the ability to serve the people is uh, extremely affected by those um, uh, demands. And that's, you know, we, we could talk about coverage, but um, you have to keep in mind that really it's, it's, it's a breathing model. Um, what are the gray areas oops, and I don't know why that are not in the legend? Rotated. Um, pardon me. So those are the, the gray and the red is uh, basically like um, underserved areas. So, and we're up here. And I don't know why this rotated. It's funny, on my presentation on my computer, it does not rotate. But here, it, <coughs> you know, um, I don't know if that's a PowerPoint thing. Forgive me. Um, so here's our, here's our proposal, or at least our original proposal. Um, this is an alternative design analysis. Um, we appreciate uh, your feedback and planning staff's feedback. Um, so we, you know, we, we came up with some photo sims, as Maru mentioned, with some alternative designs. Um, so here, to clarify, uh, our current proposal is within the antenna is a canister style antenna, but it's within a shroud. The shroud is a diameter of 10 and, and 3 quarter inch. Uh, the antenna itself is 10 inches in diameter. So just wanted to clarify that. Um, then we have two remote radio units. Um, they're about 18 inches long, and they're less than 8 inches uh, in um, width. Um, the, the width of the pole, at least as far up as I could reach, is 8 inches. So the width of the pole is more than the, the I mean, it, it, it tapers as it goes up, but it's about, the, the units themselves are about as wide as the, the uh, you know, the pole itself. Um, and then we've got a disconnect switch, which is even smaller, uh, a power disconnect. Uh, this proposal, you know, subject to the agreement with the city, would um, tap into the city's uh, power circuit that already electrifies the, uh, the light pole. 
pg e permits this and as long as we can as long as the city allows us to use the power circuit then we put a um a wireless meter inside the antenna canister that's about the size of a hockey puck so it's nice because um when the city lets us use the its own circuit um we don't have to deploy any kind of external meter so um we we're happy to modify our proposal i would say this is our you know really our current proposal it's very easy for us to um to move one of the rrus behind the existing sign um the the existing sign is um forgive me about um 30 inches long and 24 inches wide so it's completely concealed um, behind the sign. The RU would be placed on the east side of the pole. Um, the sign's on the west side. Um, so that can be easily accomplished as a um, design remediation. In San Francisco, that's being done as well to put um, the RUs behind signs wherever possible. Um, and I should mention that uh, our current proposal also is to paint the um, all the equipment to match the pole, which is what we're doing um, in other jurisdictions. If we expose the antenna itself, um, we'll be able to save three quarters of an inch. Um, we could paint the antenna to match, um, or uh, it's, it's interesting, the antenna itself, which is a uh, Galtronics model, uh, 6612, has a reflective um, uh, coating on it and the reflective coating um, allows you know it was designed so that it would kind of blend in with the sky or the clouds as you can see from this photo this is an actual installation that we well before we put the antenna canister um, on it the shroud uh, but this is one that, that was in construction that we did in Sacramento as well but then we ended up putting the, the shroud on it my opinion is that the the naked antenna with the reflective coating is a distraction, um, especially, I, I think, a, a necessary one, um, uh, especially when driving. You know, you don't want people kind of, I would say, looking up or, you know, saying, what is that? Um, but the original idea is that it would blend in with the sky or the clouds, as you can see here. And it is, a you know, a viable design solution, so. And um, last but not least, uh, we could paint the, uh, the antenna canister and the RRUs, um, the remote radio units, to um, respect the artistic aspect of Emeryville, uh, consistent with other utilities uh, done by Saeed al um, as you've probably been familiar with on uh, utility boxes. Again, um, we're happy to accommodate this, but uh, it may be a driving distraction. Um, it does draw attention to something that I think by you know, painting it to match the pole um, would otherwise be unnoticed. Um, so I would argue that painting it to match um, is the least obtrusive solution, but this is another viable um, solution. <coughs> We did look at, um, uh, you, you could place the remote radio units into some kind of a decorative base. The decorative base um, extends out, obviously, into the public right-of-way. You have a, um, uh, typically like a three-foot by three-foot base is the, um, the design for that. Um, we'd be happy to evaluate that on a case-by-case -case basis. The problem is, in this case, you have a, um, a sidewalk, and uh, we would impede the sidewalk with any kind of a decorative base. I think it'd be unnecessary, considering we do have a sign and we can hide one of the RRUs. And as I mentioned, the RRUs are about the width of the pole itself anyway. Um, I would argue the RRUs are no more obtrusive than any uh, sign. In addition, um, we did an alternative site analysis. Um, we identified a number of um, alternatives. I could go into those. Um, <coughs> the, um, there are a lot of light poles, obviously, in the area. But the one that we've selected, um, we think is best for a lot of reasons. I mean, first, it's, it's outside of a bar rather than any one of you know, condos in the area. Um, it 
it blends in, you know, with it, it's still adjacent to a building, so it's not exposed. There's another pole that we evaluated just across the street over here that's fully exposed. Um, so it does blend in. Uh, this pole does have a sign on it, so we could um, hide one of the RRUs behind the sign. Um, and um, obviously, uh, this site allows for us to meet our coverage and capacity objectives um, in the area. So. And I could go into the um, other particular site locations, but I think at this juncture um, it'd be best to answer any questions. So thank you for your time. How far apart do the RU units have to be? I'm sorry? How far apart do the RU units have to be? Um, they only have to be uh, far apart enough to uh, accommodate the, the bending of the, the cables that go into the, the units themselves. So um, you can't have them, you need to have some space for the, um, for the cables to bend out of the, the, mm -hmm. the pole and then connect with the unit. There are um, requirements for how much you're able to, to bend those cables. Um, otherwise you compromise the radio frequency. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that the, um, the RU is the width of the pole. Um, what's the other dimension in the, uh, the opposite direction? Um, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> the, so, so it's the width of the pole, but then going <coughs> protruding outside of the pole, how far is that? Oh, um, well, it's about uh, four inches um, in thickness mm -hmm. and about eight inches long. 18 inches long pardon me so Does that so makes sense so uh and i i have drawings um yeah they'd love to see that i don't know if, i think they're included in the staff report but i have a copy here yeah it's got 4.13 it's about oh. a little over four inches deep there we go yeah so a little under eight inches wide and a little. Got it. So with those dimensions, why would the base have to be three feet? If you were going to cover them, if you were going to put them in a decorative base, why would it have to be three feet? Um, the, it has to do with the, uh, I mean, there's a, there's a prefabricated model by um, a company, several companies that, that do this. Um, the three feet um, allows it to wrap around the existing pole. There's another design that would require um, the pole to be swept <coughs> out. Um, it's still about um, three feet. I think part of the problem is that um, these units are ambient cooled. So when they're mounted on the pole, they don't have any, you know, fans or anything. So the, the, uh, the air cools them. Um, I, I don't know for sure off the top of my head, but I know that the, when you know when you conceal units, then they have to you have to add fans and you have to um, you have to cool them. I don't know if if you know off the top of my head if that um, is the case with the, the decorative base situation, but um, I do know that expanding the pole um, at all for this site um, would impede the right of way. Um, the the sidewalk itself um, is there's there's three feet exactly of sidewalk that I measured um, so I mean doing any kind of a decorative base even if it was a matter of inches would impede the sidewalk we definitely would you know we'd be happy to um, you know to look at it uh, again on a site by site basis but at this site with the limited right of way space and that you know narrow sidewalk I just I don't think it's appropriate. So my understanding that the units would be contained in the decorative base, or is the correct? Okay. Okay. Yeah. It could be. You know. Is there a reason why five um, G was not included as a te technology uh, for this particular antenna? Um, because um, we're not ready for it yet here. So um, that's the simple answer. <laughs> okay. But the current proposal is to uh, meet an imminent need. So. <laughs> For and, and, 4G. And, and in terms of 3G, which at this point may be obsolete soon, uh, 4G um, is, it sounds like there's a transition happening um, from that too. Um, can you give us uh, your prediction in terms of how long um, this antenna will last without having to be uh, replaced with another antenna? Um, 
it's difficult to you know look into the uh, wireless industry crystal ball mm -hmm. um, so we don't have any current projections as to when you know this location we might have to uh, change the equipment um, 5g is coming that being said mm -hmm. um, so um, given wireless trends uh, I would imagine modifications would happen fairly regularly would that change the design of what we're looking at now potentially okay thank you <coughs> I, 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 forgive me, I also want to mention we do have um, Bill Hammett from Hammett Netison here. Um, he authored the R RF study. Um, if you have any questions for Bill about radio frequency, it's a good opportunity to ask him. I don't have any questions. Thank you for providing that. Thank you very much. Questions? We appreciate your review. And then I do not see anyone in the public who might want to make a comment on this, so I think it's up to us. Okay. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll start with, um, uh, in general, thank you for the presentation, um, and I do appreciate the staff uh, and the conversations that you've had about, and in terms of giving us three options, so thank you for that. Um, and I do think my sense is that um, I also like the idea of clustering and getting things behind signs. So I like that option of, you know, putting it behind a sign where possible. Um, I think the the only comment I would have about the um, the uh, design option where the uh, technology stands out is that I would love to see something that relates to the uniqueness of antennas because we now have an antenna thing happening as <laughs> as we've noticed but I don't understand um, in the in the sense that you know the yellow that is on the boxes of uh, uh, around town you know that's a different technology and so I wouldn't think it would actually be appropriate to copy it in, or you know copy in that style I think it, I would like a, a particular comment on this new technology and particularly the discussions we're having about like, well, what is the future? You know, what does it mean to have this throughout your community? Um, so I think the, the bigger conversation would be, I would love to see an applicant come forward with like a unique commentary on antennas and what their importance is to a community. So, um, so I would ask you to sort of think about the design concept and actually, you know, raise the bar basically um, and think about what does it mean to to b because you're going to come before us again and there'll be multiple sites. <laughs> and like, yeah. 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 Um, it, is the commission looking for uh, a bold artistic statement? Uh, I mean, if we hired um, different artists to, you know, to take a look, um, I mean, going down that avenue, I mean, I'm, I'm of the impression, especially when dealing with public right of way where there are often safety issues that um, to whatever extent you can blend in with the existing infrastructure, um, that's the safest and best course of action. But um, I would sure love the art um, <laughs> in Emeryville. Uh, I live nearby in Berkeley. I'm here often, um, so I, you know, I respect your authority on the matter, and we would, you know, we'd be happy to evaluate whatever you recommend. Yeah, I, I think I'd encourage you to at least contact the artist community and begin the discussion um, mm -hmm. of, you know, how, how can that be integrated? Because we do have the, you know, this artistic component happening in the community already. Mm -hmm. The idea that this might be another avenue for that outlet should be investigated. Um, I do think that que the question I have, I mean, I, I did want to address the issue of obtrusiveness and safety. Um, I don't have a car. So I don't get distracted, <laughs> um, but in terms of the lively and vibrant and distinctive public realm, I'm very concerned about that. And so, um, so I think that bigger perspective of how is this adding to the public realm? Um, is this creating interest? Um, is it beautifying? Is it making it a great experience? I would think those questions would be equally important. Um, so I'd encourage you to sort of think about those as well. Um, I think I agree about the base component. I don't mind them on the pole, and particularly in this location where it's it's pretty restricted. Um, so those are my comments. Can we see the questions again on, on the screen? Thank you. Um, so 
before before those come up so um to um <laughs> also build on on what was just said about the artistic um design of the poll um any artistic elements i think that sh should be presented to the public art committee as well um, and so i'd love to hear their feedback about any artistic elements added to polls um, that is a new, something new um, so um, i don't think the public mm -hmm. art committee would have jurisdiction over this matter i'm interested in their feedback about like if they have some input about design elements if that's the direction that we'd like to go um what their input would be um uh, so so not that they have jurisdiction over it but i'd like their feedback advisory mm -hmm. we'd be happy to mm -hmm. seek their um, advisory council Okay, if the applicant's mm -hmm. willing to do it voluntarily, that's fine. Yeah. Well, we obviously, we don't want it to delay the mm -hmm. process, but um, to whatever extent, feedback can be um, provided. Mm -hmm. that, that said, I actually don't, um, my opinion is that I don't think that we should add art to it, um, but if there is a design element added, I think that the, the art committee should take a look at it. Um, the, I'm, I'm more on the side of uh, trying not to draw attention to it. Um, the, the, uh, the artistic element that was added um, I, I just it was distracting um, and I, I think that the gray works better yeah. um, and uh, let's see let's make sure I'm answering these questions mm -hmm. I, I would encourage um, a, a walk through uh, San Francisco um, these days especially in the Northeast quadrant um, these facilities are on just about every other light pole mm -hmm. so um, they could see gives you a good idea of you know uh, the future of telecom okay um, so um, I I'm satisfied with appearance of the the poll um, with no design element um, and I think that in terms of the alternative designs I'm hiding the RU's behind the signage is ideal um, and um, in terms of adding some more element to the base, um, that's such a small sidewalk already. Um, I would hate to intrude more on that sidewalk there. So um, not faring on the side of adding anything to the bottom piece. Thanks. Um, I would have to say I agree with Commissioner <coughs> Guerrero. My, my desire for this is to make it as unobtrusive and disappear as possible. So put a shroud on it, make it the same color as a light pole, put all the R units, whatever you can, behind the signs. I don't think we need added bases on the sidewalks or in the street. Just keep them up out of the way and out of sight is the best. And looking at what we suggested for the art thing, I love the utility boxes. I understand them. This space is too small to really have anything that's visually interpretive to do anything like that I think what Commissioner Thompson is saying is come up with something new maybe paint them rainbow stripes or maybe put wings on them or you know if you do something I I am of the school that I don't want to see these things we you drive by them quickly or if I'm walking by I'm not gonna spend time looking up at the light poles I don't like all these added things on stuff so I would like to personally just see them gone um, visually so I don't I don't think we need to do anything but if we do I agree with Chris uh, Commissioner Guerrero that if we do do some art artistic representation what I think he's actually is that the people that approve these utility boxes it's the same thing you're putting art on something in town the art committee should have a say in it because it's public art at this point um, go I'm ahead sorry I'm looking up the public art thing but I, I'll get back to you I'll well just let me we're, we're, <coughs> the boxes that we have around town with utility boxes the yellow and black man's on did those not go before the art committee those are city sponsored exactly. projects right. they're okay. paid for out of the public art fund okay so when we put something in the realm public realm that's art regardless of who's pays for it the public art committee doesn't have a say in it no no okay well I don't think it's a bad thing that they have the, a say the, in it. the public art committee does not even have a say on the public art that is required for private development projects. Okay. They only well, have jurisdiction over the city sponsored public art and the use of the city's public art fund. Okay. So so I don't think this would be appropriate to go to the public art committee. I just don't think it's appropriate for art anyway, so <laughs> it's just, let's just leave them plain and, and put a shroud on them, make it as close to the poll as we can and call it a day. Sounds good. I would agree with uh, I would agree with the fellow commissioners on this side because I, I'd like to see them disappear. I can just 
imagine our entire city having protrusions coming out of all of our utility poles, all of our light poles, and I don't think that they're attractive. So whatever can be done to hide them. Where there are spaces where there's more room, I would love to see what can be done, how narrow can a decorative base, and by decorative I mean something that actually blends with the existing pole and is not drawing attention to itself. But I would, I would favor the shroud rather than an open thing or something that's painted, and I would favor anything that can be done to make those other boxes condense or disappear or just get out of the way. So that's Sounds my good. opinion on that. Hello. Yeah, I mean. Okay. That Thank you for your sounds. Yeah. That sounds like you've got some, a little bit of conflicting direction, but some direction. It's good direction. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay. So, are there any commissioner comments? If not. If I, if I may, if you do have any questions whatsoever for Bill Hammett, he really is um, an expert in the field um, regarding, I don't know, radio frequency, anything. It's a good opportunity, maybe best done without um, the folks who are very concerned about RF. Um, just wanted to offer that up. <laughs> I appreciate it yeah. being present. Yeah. Thank you. Does anyone have any additional questions? No? No. Nope. Not right now. In that case, meeting adjourned, 8.54.